Hey, all you screenwriters, Professor Brian Greene. Yeah, that elegant universe string theory world science festival, Brian Greene, is going to show you the correct way to time travel. Ahead on Science Goes to the Movies. Welcome to Science Goes to the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Faith Saley. Welcome. Today we have Brian Green, professor of math and physics at Columbia University and chairman and co-founder of the World Science Festival. Brian, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. The idea of time travel appears in stories as ancient as the Sanskrit epic, the Mahabharata. A Japanese tale called the Urashima Taro, believed to have been written in the year 720, tells a story of a fisherman who spends three days in an undersea palace and returns home to find 300 years have passed. Here in America, 1819 brought us Rip Van Winkle, but in all these stories, characters only skip forward in time. And then in 1895, H.G. Wells writes The Time Machine, the first travel backwards in time story to be embraced by many. Now, in the Newtonian universe, backward time travel is impossible. But then along comes Einstein with his curved space-time universe, and the boundaries of time become a little more porous. And now we have an explosion of time travel stories. Okay, so Brian, Newton versus Einstein. Einstein's curved space-time does not exclude the possibility of time travel. Why is that? Well, Einstein shows us that time is far more flexible than we would have thought based on a Newtonian world, which is really based on our intuitive picture of how the universe is put together. In Einstein's vision, time becomes flexible. It can warp. It can bend. And that definitely allows time travel to the future. That's non-controversial. And it may, although it's much more controversial, allow time travel to the past as well. When you say it definitely allows time travel to the future, meaning that's, that, can, that can happen, no that is, debate. That is within the laws of physics as we currently understand them. If you want to see what the Earth is like a million years from now, Albert Einstein lays out a blueprint for what you need to do to get there. Would but, you like to know what it of is? Of course! Yeah, so there are a couple of ways. You can go out in space, travel near the speed of light, and turn around and come back. Your clock will tick off time very slowly compared to clocks on Earth. So when you come back, maybe one year has gone by, but a million years may have gone by on the Earth clocks. Or, if you don't like traveling near the speed of light, hang out near the edge of a black hole. Again, your clock will tick off time very slowly, so when you come back to Earth, much more time will have elapsed, which means you will have leapfrogged into Earth's future. That is time travel to the future. And there's no one who doesn't agree with this who knows what they're talking about. It, so is it all gravity and speed? It's speed and gravity. That's the key new feature that Einstein injects into our understanding of time. When Einstein figured that out, um, how many hundreds of years after Newton? A couple hundred, couple yeah. A couple hundred years. Was it because Einstein's mind was capable of that thought experiment, or was it because there was technology around that Newton could never have accessed? No, no, it was the mind of Einstein. There was no technology really driving what was going on here. It was Einstein's recognition of a deeper understanding of reality. It came from, ultimately, mathematics. I mean... Can we say Einstein was a lot smarter than Newton? No, actually, if you want to put them head to head, I think I'd put Newton ahead. What? Yeah, because Newton came into the world and there wasn't a base of scientific understanding from him to jump off from. He had no he, shoulders of giants to right. stand on. That's right, although he said that he did. But that was just, you know, being quite gracious. He really invented modern way of looking at the world, the mathematical insights to the nature of reality. And look, Einstein was no slouch, don't get me wrong, right? <laughs> but in terms of revolutionizing the way we engage with reality, Newton second to none. The character Merlin in T.H. White's The Once and Future King was the first, and Amy Adams in the 2016 film Arrival is the most recent character to live his or her life in a time loop, remembering the future. All right, Brian, are Merlin and Amy Adams 
core things, um, stuck in a closed time-like curve? Not necessarily. So these are characters who somehow have access to information, knowledge about the future. As you say, they can remember the future much as you and I just simply remember the past. That doesn't mean, however, that they themselves are stuck in a time loop. They simply have epistemic access to information that ordinary people would never have access what to. What does epistemic mean? That they can have knowledge of things that we wouldn't think possible. And that's an interesting way of warping the traditional experience of time but it doesn't mean that they're going to live their lives over and over and over again in a time loop, which is what a closed time-like curve would yield. So a closed time-like curve, capital C, capital T, capital C, is a thing? It's a thing within Einstein's general relativity where, shockingly, there are solutions to the equations in which you can have a particle moving through time, but somehow time is so warped that it comes back to its starting point, not in space, but in time. We're all used to being able to go into a loop in space. I could get up right now and I could walk in a loop and keep on going. Right. Nothing confusing about that. I'm coming back to my starting point in space over and over again, big deal. But imagine going around and around and coming back to your starting point, not in space per se, but in time. That is mind bending. That is literally time bending. Uh, yeah, I, I don't get it. It isn't, what is, so we have space and we have time, but Einstein told us there's space time. Yeah, he Does that mean there are them. three different things? Space time and space time? No, he really took two things, space and time, and melded them together into one thing, a unity that he called space time. So how could you, how could you, come back to the same place in time and not be coming back to the same place in space. Well, you could come back to the same point in space as well, but that wouldn't really slap your noggin, right? It's the <laughs> fact that you're coming back to the same moment in time that really is the part that, that blows your mind. And uh, yes, so the, the ordinary characteristics of space that we're familiar with, Einstein and some said those kinds of features actually apply to time too. And that's completely different. Newton just says, look, here's space and time just elapses. Universally, it's the same for you and me, regardless of where we are or what we're doing. And Einstein says, no, 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 no. Motion through space can affect the passage through time. Hanging out near the edge of a black hole, a certain location in space affects how you experience time. Nobody would have thought there was that kind of deep connection between space and time until Einstein comes along. That's general relativity. That's general yeah, relativity. Time is relative to where you are in space. Yes, exactly. That is so noggin slapping, yeah. to borrow your very evocative <laughs> phrase. Uh, all right, so would I embarrass myself at, say, a dinner party if I suggested that mathematically a closed time-like curve is possible because the whole theory of quantum gravity isn't actually whole? I mean, oh. parts of a comprehensive theory of, of quantum gravity are missing, right? Yeah, no, that's, that's a vital point. Whenever we talk about Einstein's general relativity or even Newtonian ideas of physics, we're in the realm of so-called classical physics, which means we're not taking into account the insights of quantum physics, which is the physics of very small things. And many physicists believe that were we were to take the ideas of quantum physics and meld them with Einstein's ideas of gravity, general relativity, then some of these features that we're talking about might go away. So for instance, the thought is quantum mechanics might prevent the possibility of time travel to the past from being executed. Is it possible, in, in light of the fact that there is such a thing of, as quantum physics, I mean, there's always been quantum physics, but yes. it wasn't yeah. named, right? Right. Can one be a classical physicist today? <laughs> well, uh, you can... Can you say, oh, I prefer the classical <laughs> yes, stuff? Yes, there, no. There, 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 there are many interesting problems in physics where the quantum implications are so modest that you don't need to take them into account. So if you're looking at the orbit of the moon around the Earth or the Earth around the sun, quantum physics hardly makes any difference at all. Okay. So if you want to predict a solar eclipse, uh, you can do it using classical ideas. But yes, you're right, quantum physics underlies everything and ultimately does need to be taken into account and sometimes makes a huge difference. Is, is that the 
idea that out there somewhere is a theory of everything that combines them? Well, theory of everything is a curious phrase that I try to stay away from because okay. it seems to suggest I'd be able to predict what you had for breakfast and I don't think we're going to have a theory that Chocolate. there okay. it is, Chocolate. right? So so there's a prediction. But the the notion of unifying all our understanding of physics, general relativity and quantum mechanics into one whole, one seamless whole that is a major goal of physics today, and that would be a unified theory of the fundamental forces. And is that where folks like you who know about string theory come in? Yes. That, the, the idea of string theory is trying to make that unified theory? That's exactly the point. Einstein was the first to really articulate this idea of a unified description of nature's forces. He worked for 30 years to find the unified theory and on his deathbed was still scribbling away but never found the theory. And we think, underscore think, we don't know for sure that string theory may be the theory that he was looking for but never found. Will you be scribbling away on your deathbed? <laughs> yeah, I don't think it'll be equations. Uh. <laughs> um, what, love poems? <laughs> uh, well, there you go. Okay. Maybe. You know, I once read that Stephen Hawking, uh, he worked on an escape plan mm. for characters like Merlin and Amy Adams who would be stuck in time travel loops. It was called the chronology protection conjecture. And, and I love that Professor Hawking is so dryly funny that in his 1992 paper presenting the conjecture, he wrote, it seems that there is a chronology protection agency which prevents the appearance of closed time-like curves and so makes the universe safe for historians. So Hawking's paper sounds like a great opening to a movie, but is, is there really something that is the chronology protection conjecture? It, it could be, right? I mean, if you can travel to the past and the future, there are all sorts of potential paradoxes that come up. You've seen them, right, in, 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 in movies, right? That's yeah. what we're talking about here in, in Back to the Future, right? Marty goes back. If his traveling to the past prevented his parents from ever meeting, then how would he ever be born to be there to prevent them from meeting. So right. there's a paradoxical situation there. So how do you resolve that? Well, there, there are many proposals. Hawking's is one. Hawking's proposal is the way you resolve that is you can never travel to the past. The laws of physics. Nobody can ever. They can't ever happen. And that would indeed make everything safe. There'd be no paradoxes. History would simply unfold in one way and that would be it. Now I should say that's not the only way that you can protect the timeline, there are other proposals that people have put forward. Like? Like maybe if you go to the past, you cannot change the past. Even if you wanted to prevent- Kill your, Hitler, everybody wants to kill yeah, Hitler. Yeah, if you want to do that, you, you try to pull the trigger and the laws of physics somehow prevent that sequence of events from ever taking place. And I should say, there is mathematics behind this where people have set up the possibility of time travel to the past in controlled environments, like just a, a game of pool. And they found that you could never have a pool ball go back into the past and prevent that pool ball from going into the hole by which it traveled to the past. There can't be paradoxical situations, at least according to certain mathematical calculations. How, uh, okay. How do you do an how do you do an experiment like that? You well, mentioned this is both a thought math experiment. and okay, it's a thought experiment. Yeah. There there wasn't an actual pool table with a whole bunch of graduate students hanging around it and saying, "Is it going <laughs> to knock the ball out of its own trajectory?" Okay, okay. No, no, this is pure mathematics, but it shows you the power of, of math. mathematics to describe the universe. It can give you insights into the nature of how reality unfolds that otherwise would just be creative musings lacking any real anchor. So in all these time travel movies the, or, or TV shows, the screenwriter always creates you know, time police or, or some other force protecting time, like in all those time patrol stories by Powell Anderson or, or the movie Looper, where time travel was illegal and only organized crime syndicates dare to use it. And of course, in every fifth episode of Doctor Who, the doctor is running afoul of the Time Lords. But from what you say, Brian, there, there really is a time protection agency maybe and it's called math yeah but underscore the maybe yes it could be that math prevents this kind of time travel to the past but the math is suggestive right now it's not definitive the door to travel to the past in my opinion is still a tiny bit open and the future will tell whether we can slip through it door to the future totally open yes 
door to the past a little bit open. A crack. Do you, just on a, like a personal Brian Greene level, do you believe it's possible? My beliefs are shaped by experiments in and mathematics. Math. And okay. there's no basis for judgment as yet. Do you wish you could? Yes, I think anything that changes the way we grasp reality is the most exciting experience that, that we can have. So yeah, that would be amazing. I'd love to talk about some of the time travel tropes that, that seem to draw on real physics. Let's start with the most obvious. The, the overarching rule of fictional time travel is create no paradoxes. And, and paradox is this word that screenwriters love to toss around. What does it exactly mean in science? In, a paradox in science is a situation in which you come to a result that's logically inconsistent. You're saying this is true and this is not true a logical inconsistency, which we call a paradox. And we often throw around the word paradox in science a little bit loosely. Bottom line is, science cannot have any paradoxes. It needs to be logically consistent, logically coherent. That's there are what no science paradoxes. means? Paradox-free? Science makes no sense if it embraces paradox. So, does paradox involve something wrong, something yes, incorrect? Yes, yes, exactly. So every supposed paradox that science has ever faced, when we looked at it more closely, it may have forced us to change our understanding, but we resolve those paradoxes. We find a way of making those features of reality consistent. That's what we do. But, but for We're the paradox police, if you want to use that language. <laughs> um, all right, let's talk about Wolfgang Pauli. Wolfgang Ernst Pauli was born in April of 1900. He was a pioneer in quantum physics, and unbeknownst to him, Wolfgang Pauli has made major contributions to modern sci-fi cinema. In movies like Back to the Future, among countless others, characters traveling backwards must always steer clear of their younger selves. And some time travel flicks go so far as to say that if you touch your younger self while time traveling, you will both immediately explode, all because of the Pauli exclusion principle. Okay, Brian, first off, what is the Pauli exclusion, exclusion principle? And probably more importantly, what is your advice to confronting your younger self during time travel? Yeah, so, so the Pauli exclusion principle is a real principle in quantum physics, where it says that certain kinds of particles, they have a name, they're called fermions, doesn't matter, but certain kinds of particles cannot exist in the same quantum state which means they can't be in the same place and have all of the same qualities. The math forbids that from ever happening. If you, ah. if you want to apply this to time travel very loosely, I guess, I've never seen these statements, the thought is, well, here are some particles that make up me, and those same particles are ah. making up my other self, and therefore, if they come together, there's something that will prevent them from touching, because in some sense, the particles will be in the same quantum state. That's a very, very loose <laughs> interpretation. That's a long way to go ideas. to make yeah. that. Okay. I mean, obviously, the, the, the particles of the time travel version of me need not be in exactly the same quantum state as the earlier incarnation of those particles and therefore I can shake hands with my earlier self and be quite safe. Oh, okay. So your advice is maybe hug it out if you meet your younger self, see what happens. Here's my, my advice on, on time travel. If, yes. if you can travel to the past, do not worry at all because I believe that the timeline is fixed and if you travel to the past, it means that you were always part of that moment that you are now entering. There are not two versions of January 1st, 1999, one that happened with you there and one that happened without you there. That doesn't make any sense to me at all. Wait, but, what about the multiverse? Yeah, well, the multiverse gives you another way out of the time travel paradoxes. I'm glad that you raised that. So it could be that when you travel to the past, you don't travel to the past of your own universe. You travel to the past of a parallel copy of your universe, and therefore, if you prevent your parents from meeting, that's not such a big deal, because it only means that you won't be born in that universe, but your origin in the original universe is completely safe. But isn't every universe your universe if you exist in it? Uh, well, there are these parallel realities, and some you will be in, and some you will not. And that's... Perfectly self -es fine. self esteem crushing. If there's a multiverse, don't you want to exist in all of them? <laughs> yeah, but, but it even goes the other way around because, uh, you know, if, if there are these various copies of you in some of these universes, maybe not all of them, who are you? 
who, right? I mean, who, I mean, if I'm here now, who am I there? Like, am but, I really like who's the real you? Or are they all the real you? Or has your this, identity been smeared out across all these universes? Does this, this stuff would keep me up at night and give me the shakes. But this is your, this is your metier. Does it, are you totally sanguine with these kind of questions? This is sort of the bread and butter of what we do. And the, the deeper we head into the mathematics, sometimes the stranger the ideas that emerge. And it doesn't mean that they're all correct, but it does mean that they're worthy of consideration. And that's what we give them. The, the 2004 film, The Butterfly Effect, starring Ashton Kutcher, took its title from a phrase in MIT meteorology professor Edward Lorenz's 1963 groundbreaking mathematical paper with the very boring title, Deterministic Non-Periodic Flow. Lorenz detailed how a tiny change can dramatically alter pretty much anything over time. And, and like the flap of a butterfly's wing, the effect of Lorenz's work was nearly imperceptible at first. But by the 1980s, many scientists across genres began to recognize the ways Lorenz's work challenged long-held views of the world. So, Brian, the time travel movie, The Butterfly Effect, was devoted to seeing Ashton Kutcher look hot while time traveling. But, but time travel as an idea um, became more commonly known as the, the chaos theory. Is that right? Or chaos theory? Yeah, chaos theory is an is a important development in our understanding of, of physics and reality where, as you rightly described, small changes today, tiny, infinitesimal changes today, can over time yield fantastically rich changes in the future. And that means that it's very hard to make specific and detailed predictions in these systems because it's so hard to lay out the state of things today with that kind of accuracy to not have the uncertainty of the butterfly's wings flapping. Does that only apply when you're thinking about quantum things or with anything? No, small no. Changes today. Small changes can make a big difference even in classical systems. Okay, so Brian, I, I have to admit, this, this, whole, this whole event has just been warming you up for the big question. Um, uh -oh. as, as a physicist and as a mathematician, what is time? Uh, pff, that's a hard one. Uh, I don't know. I know a lot about the nature of time. From Einstein, we've learned qualities of time that you wouldn't have thought possible, many of which we've discussed here today. But if you ask me what time actually is, it's very hard to give an answer. In some sense, it's that quality of reality that allows for change. We notice that time has elapsed by things being different. But to go further than that and really grasp time the way we can grasp other features of reality is, is an open question. Could it be, for instance, that time itself is made up of something more fine, more fundamental? Could there be atoms or molecules of time itself that only when those atoms and molecules arrange themselves in the right way, they yield the conception of time that you and I have in our intuitive brains. That's a possibility. When we're sitting here even using the word time, does that implicitly always mean space-time? Because time is, yes. is inextricable with space, that, thank that's you, That's right, that's right. But could this be an emergent idea that makes sense on human scales, but perhaps the concept of time breaks down if you try to invoke it in the microscopic quantum domain. That's a possibility. Wow. So Brian, there's this TV show, This Is Us, and people love it. It's, it's, a, it's a big, sobby soap opera, but, it, but it's also a kind of backwards time travel show in that these characters, the past and the present world of this family, is all happening for them at once. And, and time is not linear for this family. So your father and your husband and you're a scientist, and, and you're human. Um, do you think maybe there's, I, I can't think of a really a, another word for it, but maybe a depth to time that we can't entirely comprehend? I think so. I would think that the next great breakthrough in our understanding of the universe is going to be a radical new conception of time. Time has woven its way into our theories of reality since we started, since the time of Newton. But I think that we're missing something deep. And I think that there's a richness, a quality to time that we've yet to really touch. And when we touch it, our understanding is going to go through a radical change. The notion of writers and artists trying to get to the essence of 
of, of whether time is like who we are in a timeline. Are we, are we who we used to be? Are we our future? Are we all of it at once? Intersects with what science is trying to get at. At absolutely. what time means. Yes, absolutely. You know, somebody once described to me that what life is about is you have this temporal tale that keeps getting longer and longer and you carry it with you throughout your life. And to be able to look back at these different versions of you that existed at different moments in time and to recognize that in an Einsteinian world, those versions of you still exist. They've not gone away. They are part of reality at the moment at which they existed. And that's really what we all are. That's what life is. I wish we were stuck in a closed time-like curve so I could keep talking <laughs> to you forever. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for for this show. Um, Brian, thank you so much for joining us today. And we are so lucky to have Professor Brian Green staying with us to shoot another show. On next week's show, we'll be joined by the fabulous, timeless comic Lewis Black. Mr. Black and Professor Green will be debating the existence of math jokes. Really, seriously, Black and Green, math jokes. Be sure to check out our Science Goes to the Movies Facebook page for web-only clips and to keep up with everything related to Science Goes to the Movies all in one place. And if you want to watch past episodes, check us out at www.cuny.tv under the Science tab or try out our new YouTube channel where you'll find lots of science and movies.